Shalom, my friends. Welcome to this week's news. <laughs> There's a lot to report. You know, when I started this, uh, I wanted to keep it down to 15, 20 minutes max, but the things to report on just keep increasing in numbers. So anyway, I'm going to try and blaze through this. We're going to start off, of course, with wars and rumors of wars. Libya is in civil war and on the verge of total anarchy. Islamic State armies are building a self-declared caliphate across Syria and Iraq. And Afghanistan's young democracy is on the verge of paralysis, among many other things. To these troubles are added a resurgence of tensions with Russia and a relationship with China divided between pledges of cooperation and public recrimination. The concept of order that has underpinned the modern era is in crisis. Although the Vatican says it's meaningless, Israeli sources told the Italian newspaper Two Tempo that the Pope is in the crosshairs of ISIS, further stating that Pope Francis is being targeted because he is, quote, the greatest exponent of the Christian religions and the bearer, bearer of false truths, close quote. And a Catholic news agency reports that Italy has issued a nationwide terror alert despite no imminent threats or specifics about a potential attack on the country. On Friday, August 29th, President Obama gave a proclamation regarding National Preparedness Month, warning of possible emergencies, quote, from hurricanes and wildfires to cyber and terrorist attacks can strike anywhere at any time, close quote. Taiwan plans to spend more than $19 billion in the next nine years to acquire anti-missile systems to boost its aerial defenses against Beijing. The Defense Ministry aims to purchase the Skybo-3 surface-to-air missile system between next year and 2024 to replace the aging Hawk missile systems. This will be the biggest procurement of domestically made weapon systems in recent years. Taiwanese experts estimate the People's Liberation Army currently has more than 1,600 missiles aimed at the island of Taipei. Turning to Israel. Israel laid claim on Sunday, August 31st, to 400 hectares, that's nearly 1,000 acres, of West Bank land in a Jewish settlement block near Bethlehem, a step that could herald significant Israeli construction in the area, defying Palestinian demands for a halt in settlement expansion. Further, this may be the largest single appropriation of West Bank land in decades, and it could dramatically change the reality of the area. Signs have been posted on the land by military administrators saying, quote, state land, no trespassing, close quote. The political directive to expedite a survey of the land came after three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped and killed in June while hitchhiking in that area. The timing of the land appropriation suggests that it is meant as a kind of compensation for the settlers and as a punishment for the Palestinians. It's been declared state land as opposed to land privately owned by Palestinians clearing the way for the potential approval of Israeli building plans. This has quickly turned attention back to the Israeli-occupied West Bank and only adds to the already unlikely prospects of any Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Turning to Gaza, an open-ended ceasefire took effect on Tuesday, August 26th after so many truces, none of which held during this seven-week-long conflict, there is still much skepticism, especially among Israelis, that this one will bring quiet to Gaza and Israel. But 
So far, it is holding. Palestinians killed 2,143. Israelis killed 69 plus one Thai migrant worker. Israeli targets struck in Gaza 5,263. Rockets fired into Israel 4,564. Rockets exploded in Israeli territory 3,641. Rockets destroyed by Iron Dome 735. Buildings destroyed in Gaza estimated 10,800. Buildings damaged in Gaza estimated 50,000 including 277 schools, 270 mosques, and 10 hospitals. The source for this information comes from the Israeli army and various Palestinian sources. Turning to Iraq, Iraqi security forces, Shiite militiamen, and Kurdish fighters launched a major operation on Saturday, August 30th, to break the more than two-month jihadist siege of Amrli, a Shiite town. This operation had been in the works for days, with Iraqi aircraft carrying out strikes and forces massing for the drive toward Amrli, which has been besieged since militants led by the Islamic State launched a major offensive in June. Residents face major shortages of food and water and are in danger both because of their Shiite faith, which jihadists consider heresy, and their resistance to the militants, which has drawn harsh retribution elsewhere. Forces from two other Shiite militias, Asaib al-Alhaq, and the powerful Saraya al-Salam forces were also gathering north of Amrli for the attack, as well as many Peshmerga fighters, and the U.S., Australia, France, and the U.K., helped out by airdropping humanitarian aid packages and conducting airstrikes. Then, on Sunday, August 31st, Iraqi security and volunteer forces broke the siege of Amrli and entered the town, inspiring a wave of celebrations, with residents waving the Iraqi flag and firing celebratory shots into the air. Turning to the Islamic State, the IS is using every contemporary mode of messaging to recruit fighters, intimidate enemies, and promote its claim to have established a caliphate, a unified Muslim state run according to a strict interpretation of Islamic law. If its bigotry and beheading seem to come from a distant century, my friends, its use of media is avant-garde. While the IS may be built on bloodshed, it seems intent on demonstrating the bureaucratic acumen of the state that it claims to be building. Its two annual reports so far are replete with a sort of jihadist-style bookkeeping, tracking statistics on everything from cities taken over and knife murders committed by ISIS forces to checkpoints set up and even apostates repented. In the past, bin Laden addressed a single static camera with long-winded rhetoric in highly formal Arabic. His videos had to be smuggled to Al Jazeera or another television network to be aired, but today we have characters like the YouTube star Anwar al Orlaki, the American-born cleric killed in a drone strike in Yemen in 2011, who addressed Westerners in colloquial English, had a blog and a Facebook page, and helped produce a full-color English language magazine called Inspire. Dozens of Twitter accounts spread its message and has posted some major speeches in seven languages. Its videos reflect flavors of Madison Avenue and Hollywood, combat video games and cable television dramas, and its sensational deliveries are echoed and amplified on social media. 
When its accounts are blocked, new ones appear immediately. It also uses services like Just Paste to publish battle summaries, SoundCloud to release audio reports, Instagram to share images, and WhatsApp to spread graphics and videos, displaying a grand talent for targeting the younger generation. One polished IS video features a Canadian recruit named Andre Poulain, urging North American Muslims to follow him and even to bring their families. Quote, you'd be very well taken care of here, he said in the video. Your families would live here in safety, just like how it is back home. Close quote. In another English language video pitch, a British fighter identified as Brother Abu Bara al Hindi poses the call to jihad as a test for comfortable Westerners. Quote, Are you willing to sacrifice the fat job you've got, the big car, the family? he asks. Despite such luxuries, he says, quote, Living in the West, I know how you feel. In the heart, you feel depressed. The Prophet Muhammad said, the cure for depression is jihad, close quote. Such appeals provoke great curiosity. Conversely, instead of emphasizing jihad as a means of personal fulfillment, the Arabic media production portrays it as a duty for all Muslims. It flaunts violence towards its foes, especially Shiites and the Iraqi and Syrian security services, while portraying the killing as just vengeance. The State Department's Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications has stepped up its efforts to counter ISIS propaganda, publishing a steady stream of ISIS horror tales on Facebook and Twitter using the hashtag ThinkAgainTurnAway. However, these attempts are not gaining much ground. Last week, an ISIS fighter calling himself Abu Tarab wrote on Twitter, quote, For those who want to come but are facing obstacles, be patient and keep the desire for jihad alive within you always, close quote. The State Department account replied, quote, ISIS recruits two choices commit atrocities and die as criminals, get nabbed and waste lives in prison, close quote. And as of Friday, August 29th, Abu Turaab's comment had been named as favorite 32 times and the count for the State Department's response was at zero. Now, the IS has a new English language publication, Dabik aimed at young Muslims in the western states. The magazine declares, quote, Islamic State will do everything within its means to continue striking down every apostate who stands as an obstacle on its path towards Palestine, vowing that, quote again, the Islamic State's actions speak louder than its words, and it is only a matter of time and patience before it reaches Palestine to fight the barbaric Jews and kill those of them hiding behind the Gargad trees, the trees of the Jews, close quote. The publication's second issue opens by telling its readers, quote, the first priority is to perform hijrah, meaning migrate from wherever you are to the Islamic State, from the state of the infidel to the state of Islam, close quote. Further, the online magazine is now suggesting targets for lone wolf terror attacks. Among them listed are Times Square, Las Vegas, and the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Two years ago, the magazine gave instructions on how to create firebombs and suggested attacks on U.S. forests in the West. A month later, the Waldo Canyon fire broke out in Colorado Springs, killing two and destroying some 300 homes. And although no connection has been made with the Al-Qaeda threat, no cause has ever been determined either. Concerning the recent video of American journalist James Foley's execution, the IS militant dressed in black and speaking English in a British accent led to a manhunt to identify the British man. 
assessments by Britain's two intelligence and security agencies led to the positive identification of 23-year-old British-born Abdel Majed Abdel Bari, nicknamed Jihadi John by his colleagues. King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia has warned that the West will be the next target of the jihadists sweeping through Syria and Iraq unless there is rapid action. Quote, if we ignore them, I am sure they will reach Europe in a month and America in another month. Close quote. The Islamic State is entering the U.S.-Mexico border. Breitbart, Texas, has exclusively obtained and confirmed a document warning federal agents across the entire U.S.-Mexico border about an ISIS terrorism threat. The document was released by the Texas Department of Public Safety and warned that ISIS was actively promoting and encouraging supporters to take advantage of the porous U.S.-Mexico border to carry out terrorist attacks against U.S. citizens. A Border Patrol agent in Laredo sector told Breitbart, Texas, that ISIS was attempting to find individuals and groups in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, to assist in gaining entry into the United States. President of Judicial Watch Tom Fitton said, quote, If your law enforcement sources do not have the information we have, they are being ill-served by their leadership. We put this out to protect the safety of law enforcement and citizens along the border. This is a public safety announcement. Close quote. Turning to Libya. Libya has been sliding into chaos since Gaddafi was overthrown and killed three years ago, with interim authorities confronting powerful militias which fought to oust the veteran dictator. And now... Ministry and state offices in Tripoli have been occupied by armed militias who are preventing government workers from entering and are threatening their superiors. The government announced last week it had tendered its resignation to Parliament days after a rival Islamist administration was created. The parliament, which was elected in June, and the government are operating out of eastern Libya for security reasons, while a rival body, the General National Congress, has named pro-Islamist figure Omar al-Hassi to form a salvation government. Interim authorities have been steadily losing ground to the militias, and the so-called Libya Dawn, mainly Islamist Alliance, which seized Tripoli Airport on August 22nd after weeks of fierce fighting with nationalist rivals. On Sunday, August 31st, Islamist militiamen moved into the U.S. Embassy compound in Tripoli that was evacuated in late July, with videos showing cheering men diving from an upstairs balcony into the facility's swimming pool. Turning to Russia, Ukraine and Western governments accuse Russia of sending troops and armor to back the separatists in a conflict that has already killed over 2,000 people. Russia denies the charge. Quote, Russia is far from being involved in any large-scale conflicts, Putin says. We don't want that and don't plan on it, but naturally we should always be ready to repel any aggression towards Russia. Putin continuing, Russia's partners should understand it's best not to mess with us. Thank God I think no one is thinking of unleashing a large-scale conflict with Russia. I want to remind you that Russia is one of the leading nuclear powers. Close quote. NATO is reportedly working towards the creation of an expeditionary force composed of 10,000 troops from seven different member states as a result of escalating tensions with Russia over the conflict in Ukraine. The force's creation will be spearheaded by Britain and involve contributions from Denmark, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Norway, and the Netherlands. 
Canada is also interested in joining the group, but it's not known what its final decision will be. And although no formal announcement has been made, British Prime Minister David Cameron is expected to declare its formation at the upcoming NATO summit in Wales on September 4th. Turning to London, on Friday, August 29th, Britain raised the terror threat level from substantial to severe. Severe is the second highest of five levels. This is in light of the growing danger from British jihadists returning from Iraq and Syria. Some 500 to 600 Brits are believed to have gone to Iraq and Syria and at least half of them have returned with some feared to be planning attacks. A laptop seized from the IS in Syria contained research on how to make a biological bomb and religious justification to use it against civilians. Londoner Hamza Parvez, 21 years old, claims he has been fighting for the violent extremists for five months and calls on other Muslim Britons to give up their weekly Nandos and come Quote, come to the land of jihad and shout Allah, close quote. With his face hidden behind a black scarf which only shows his eyes, and speaking in a thick London accent, he tells the camera, quote, this is the golden era of jihad, close quote. His brother told a London reporter, quote, that's not my brother. My brother doesn't act like that. My brother doesn't call people to do violence against others. I don't recognize him. That's just the same body. It's not the characteristic of my brother. It's not the way he speaks. It's not the way he acts. It's not the way he addresses people. That's not my brother. I don't know what my brother is anymore. He's my best friend. He was my best friend. Close quote. Global warming update. <laughs> The speech by former U.S. Vice President Al Gore was apocalyptic. Quote, the North Polar ice cap is falling off a cliff, he said. It could be completely gone in summer and as little as seven years, seven years from now, close quote. Those comments came in 2007 as Mr. Gore accepted the Nobel Peace Prize for his campaigning on climate change. <laughs> so much the validity of the Nobel Peace Prize, if you ask me, my friends. But seven years after his warning, the Arctic ice cap has expanded for the second year in a row, with a surge, depending on how you measure it, of between 43 and 63 percent since 2012. The Spirit of Jezebel Jezebel was a Phoenician princess who married Ahab, king of Israel. Her father was Ethbaal, king and high priest of the Sidonians. Queen Jezebel introduced Baal worship into Israel, sometimes called Baal worship. The proper pronunciation is Baal which gives us clues as to the workings of Jezebel. The name Baal means Lord or Possessor, and therefore referring to our Messiah or to Abba Father as Lord is something we should teach ourselves to stop doing, my friends. Baal was the sun god of Phoenicia and the supreme deity among the Can Canaanites or the Canaanites and various other pagan nations. His full title is Baal Shamayim, which means Lord or Possessor of the Heavens. The Canaanites, due to Baal worship, participated in sex worship, fertility rites, religious prostitution, eating things sacrificed to idols, and human sacrifice, all to pacify false gods. And it was Jezebel who taught and seduced the Kodesh servants of Elohim to commit such acts of blasphemy. Easton's Bible Dictionary says, quote, 
Jezebel has stamped her name on history as the representative of all that is designing, crafty, malicious, revengeful, and cruel. She is the first great instigator of persecution against the believers or the saints of God. Quoting. Guided by no principle, restrained by no fear of either God or man, passionate in her attachment to her heathen worship, she spared no pains to maintain idolatry around her in all its splendor. Close quote. Matthew Henry's commentary calls Jezebel, quote, a zealous idolater, extremely imperious and malicious in her natural temper, addicted to witchcrafts and whoredoms and every way vicious. Close quote. Clearly, the spirit of Jezebel is interested in more than control and manipulation. We need to learn to discern the deeper motive of this spirit if we ever hope to resist the temptations that will lead to the great falling away that Paul, that is Shaul, writes about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and Jude, that is Yahuda, urges us in verse 4 to earnestly contend for the belief which was once for all delivered to the Kodeshim because certain men have slipped in, wicked ones corrupting the favor of our Elohim for indecency and denying the only Adon, Yahuwah, and our Adon, Yahshua, Hamashiach. Close quote. The spirit of Jezebel is clearly running rampant in the world today, my friends, and is also running loose in churches and local congregations without anyone ever noticing it or confronting it. And Jezebel's influence runs much deeper than a desire to make someone a mouthpiece or a puppet or to control the worship song list or to intimidate people from joining inner circles in order to guard the leadership positions of those it controls. Anyone who is being influenced or dominated by the spirit of Jezebel is a subtle seducer. The key word there is subtle if Jezebel were obvious, no one would be fooled. A Jezebelite usually has a charismatic personality that draws people to false gods and away from Elohim, sometimes succeeding in this idolatry by exalting pastors, puffing them up, putting them on a pedestal, giving them the esteem that only Elohim deserves, or by luring people to the things of the world, or by introducing doctrines and principles that sound godly but come from the world's system through the doctrines of men and or demons. Likewise, a Jezebelite is quick to encourage sin. For example, someone confides in a Jezebelite that he or she is having sex outside of wedlock. The Jezebelite will assure them that it's okay if they're in love, easing the guilt and glossing over any godly conviction they might feel. Please be careful, however. If we look only for control and manipulation tactics in others, we may wrongly accuse people of flowing in a Jezebel spirit. And lastly, there have been strong lines drawn between Elohim's prophets and Jezebel. Remember, it was the wicked queen Jezebel who is credited with killing Yahuwah's prophets. Obadiah risked his life by hiding a hundred prophets in two caves and feeding them bread and water, while Jezebel's own prophets sat at a table overflowing with rich food and wine. See 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 4 and 19. From this contrast, we see there are carnal rewards for cooperating with Jezebel in this lifetime. And there are eternal rewards for refusing to tolerate this wicked spirit. In Revelation, that is Chazon, chapter 2, verse 20, Yahshua mentions Jezebel in his letter to the church of Thyatira. 
This scripture concerning the church of Thyatira speaks to what becomes the global church, the apostate church, which goes through the upcoming tribulation. Yeshua says, quote, I hold this against you, that you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, claiming to be inspired to teach and lead my servants astray, that is, teaching unscriptural doctrines and beliefs. If it isn't the word, my friends, it's a lie. Beguiling them to commit whoring and to eat offerings made to idols. Close quote. And that's the news for this week, my friends. Thank you for your support. And uh, Abba willing, I'll see you next week. Until then, shalom, my friends. And I consume enough is time alone with you Underneath a naked moon Sharing confidential moods And making chatter Mockingbird nocturnal sings Notations of eternal things Entering the quantum breeze Flying not for want of wings He lights his gaze on you and me Simply because we matter